Hi, today I want to do something a little different. We've done a lot of kind of intense music tutorials lately on harmony and improvisation and understanding music by ear. And I want to do something a little different. I just wanted to have a chance to talk to you for a minute about an idea that comes up a lot in questions that I get from students. And it helped me realize that there's kind of a point of view that, um, that not everybody has been exposed to and that I think it could really help you. And the idea is that, you know, th there's only so far in your journey that you can be assisted by other people's ideas and recommendations and exercises and teaching, even, even our own teaching. You've got to really make your own creative choices about which of the things we can offer you are valuable, which ones are worth exploring very deeply, which ones are maybe not relevant to your goals. In other words, your creative freedom as an artist starts with your freedom to study what you find most interesting and what you find most beautiful. And when you do find something interesting or beautiful that really captures your, your fascination, I just encourage you to double down on that and take that as far as you want to go with it. In other words, I don't want Improvise For Real to ever be seen as something dogmatic that lays out a path that you must follow in exactly this order. What we're trying to do is just the opposite. We want to put at your disposal a very clear vision of our musical system so you can see all the raw materials of your art. And we want to give you the tools to explore all those sounds and to learn to create your own music with them. But we never want to interfere with your freedom to make your own choices about what you find interesting and what you want to explore in that world. And so part of this freedom that you have means it's also a responsibility to, to really invent your own exercises. You can't wait for somebody else to tell you this is a good exercise, you should practice this. Absolutely listen to those suggestions because you'll find a ton of great exercises that way that will lead you to a lot of very important musical discoveries and that's great. But you'll also have your own ideas and you don't have to ask for permission. I get emails all the time, people saying things like, you know, I bought your audio course, Sing the Numbers, which is designed to just listen to these beautiful melodies and we sing them to you in tonal numbers and you can sing them back in tonal numbers and I think it's the very best way to do ear training, especially for creative improvisers. And the question is, should I also play along with my instrument as a separate activity? Should I use those audio tracks where you're singing the tonal numbers to, it, to me and should I play those notes back on my instrument in whatever key we happen to be in? And my question is, what are you waiting for? What, if I tell you no, you're not going to do it? Of course you should do it. Every idea you have, you should go ahead and try it. Give it a try. See what kinds of crazy musical experiences you can get into because you'll learn something from all of it. In my own life, and this is no prescription for other people, it's just more of a confession of some of the weird things I have done. Um, some of the most beautiful and powerful music I was ever exposed to was the music of Miles Davis' second quintet in the 1960s with Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock, uh, Ron Carter and Tony Williams. That to me just sounded like all of the most beautiful and mysterious and interesting sounds of classical music, European classical music, combined with this intense African rhythm. I just, I, I was blown away. And I also understood that I could not improvise with those people and I could not improvise with that music. I, I didn't understand anything that they were doing. And, and I very quickly realized that nobody else could explain it to me either. I had found lots of teachers, lots of books, trying to analyze that music and trying to explain what those musicians were doing and how they came to be able to do what they were doing. And it was very clear to me that, um, that nobody really, at least I couldn't get the information I needed to get from what those people were trying to explain. And my personal opinion is that they didn't get it either. And so I had this idea that well, these, these musical ideas that these guys have, they came from somewhere. And so because we have recordings, I could go back to the earliest recordings of Miles Davis. I could go back to his earliest bebop recordings with Charlie Parker from the 1940s. And I could start there and I could listen to his entire discography across the whole 20th century. And I was in college at the time and so we had a music library. And I was very fortunate that I could go into this music library and they actually had all these records. I mean they had like 95% of the records that Miles ever played on. It was mostly vinyl, LPs, there were some cassettes, this was before CDs. But one summer I literally sat in that music library and I listened to the entire Miles Davis discography from the first record to the last, every second of every track, just me sitting there with my headphones, I brought a sandwich for lunch, and that's what I did all summer long. We're talking about more than a hundred hours of just 
beautiful artistic recordings listened to in serial, one after another, just so that I could take that aesthetic journey with this artist and try to understand for myself the evolution of those ideas. Now here's another confession that's even weirder. A few years later, this is after CDs came out, at that point I was trying to understand the music of Ornette Coleman. There was something about it that was very beautiful and very haunting to me, but harmonically it all sounded wrong and crazy. And I got the idea that the music of J.S. Bach was, was considered to be kind of the height of almost maniacal logic. It was the most orderly music ever composed. And so I got this idea that what I was going to do is program my CD player to go during the night, all night long, while I slept, to alternate between a CD of, of Bach and a CD of Ornette Coleman. And I thought just juxtaposing these two, one after the other, would somehow nourish my brain and make neural connections in my mind that would enable me to understand the harmonic logic of Ornette Coleman's music. Now, does that make any sense at all? I have no idea. I don't know if I learned anything from that. I don't know if I got anything from that experience. But it's another example of what I want to share with you, which is just the empowerment to get interested in stuff, to get excited about stuff, and to double down on that excitement, and to chase after the things that you find interesting and beautiful, and to invent your own ways to study them, even if they sound crazy. Because when you get yourself out of that passive role of the student that's waiting to be told what exercises you need to practice and what skills you need to learn and what's important and what's not important, that's when you become the source of both the question and the answer. And that's when you step out of the role of a music student and you become a music philosopher. And so my message to you today is to believe in yourself and to, and to chase those ideas and fascinations all the way to the end and to trust that on that journey, you're going to make so many beautiful discoveries, even if it's all kind of crazy, you're going to get so much out of that, that some piece of your treasure is going to be found on that path. And so I just encourage you to supplement everything we're trying to teach you and, and share with you with your own ideas and to believe in those ideas and to pursue them just as passionately as you pursue anything that I might suggest to you.